So uh, thank you for coming. Why do we do this? First of all, because we believe passionately in the well-being of our youth, and we believe passionately that caring for youth in a multi-generational community of flourishing and care and faith, which we call churches, is essential for their well-being, for their formation, and for grounding their lives with foundations of flourishing and sources of resilience against the vicissitudes and the suffering which comes with every lived life. And we do this because we believe passionately in supporting and nurturing youth ministry, because our young people are not just, as they're so often called, the future of the church, they are the present of the church. When Jesus said he came that they may have life and have it abundantly, he meant the kids as well as the adults, if not especially the kids. And when he said, I commission you to go forth to all nations to make disciples, of course, he must have meant our kids as well. They're not excluded. So we want to support active, generative, caring, passionate ministry for our young people. And we believe deeply that an active, caring, passionate ministry for our young people has to introduce them to the gospel as a foundation for life, not just sin management, not just hell avoidance, not just a ticket to the sweet by and by, but that Jesus came and when he said that I come that they may have life and have it abundantly, he also meant now. But that is a, that is a really important concept to break down because we don't believe he meant prosperity gospel. Lord, won't you give me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all have Porsches. I must make amends. If you're over 50, you recognize Janis Joplin. If you're younger, maybe you listen to a classic rock station. Not prosperity gospel, but the life, self-sacrificing life of discipleship, grounded in the practices, orientations, and habits of the faith that counterintuitively lives to the, leads to the most beautiful life, the most resilient life. And we're here because we know you are on the front lines of youth ministry. You, there could hardly be a more important vocation that touches the future and resources the lives that will go on for years beyond our work. And we just want to welcome you to Yale Divinity School and spoil you and give you a time to meet one another, understand the community of federal travelers in which you participate, and strengthen and renew you for the incredibly important missions that you undertake. So thank you for being here. And since, since our, the author of our guest today is the author of the book Thanks and probably the leading scholar on the world on gratitude, we probably ought to give thanks for our meals. So I wonder if you'll share me in a blessing on the food before us. God, the author of all gifts, the source of all blessings. We give you our thanks and our praise. We thank you for the gift of life, the gift of this day, the gift of one another to one another, the gift of vocation and the faith to respond to your call. We ask your blessing on this food before us, on the friendships that we will make today, on the conversations generated in this room and in the wisdom and experience and scholarship that Bob Evans and Mark Afshar are here to bring. We ask your blessings as well on all those today who in a season of thanksgiving have too little or none. Bless to us soft hearts, ears to hear and eyes to see them as our neighbors and to care for them as our community as well. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. 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 We are here for a monthly lecture, and if I could just ask you to spend two minutes with me, T taking the brochure that's in front of you and taking a look at the guests that are coming on a monthly basis. You can see that the grounds for this monthly lecture series for three years was a generous gift from the John Templeton Foundation that made it possible for eight of the leading practical theologians in our country from all parts of the country to gather and ask the question, if we care about our young people's flourishing, that the gospel might live in their lives as a source of joy and flourishing, what are the most important practices and attitudes that we need to nurture in our youth ministries? And how can we do it? And who are the leading experts in the world to come help us with that? And if you take a quick look at the brochure on our summer program for this summer, 
you can see that those same leading practical theologians asked, what are the sources of our kids' suffering? The things that are killing our kids, for which there is an answer from the gospel and our communities of faith to nurture them with strength and resilience and even joy in the midst of suffering. This is what we are trying to deliver into your ministry. I hope you'll take a look at the materials and consider how you might participate with us in these lectures, in these programs, in the publications and curricular materials that will follow. And speaking of the publications, I want to one lift, lift one right up, which you can get today, which is Raising Hope for Paths to Courageous Living for Black Youth by Dr. Ann E. Streety Wimberly and my partner here at Yale, Dr. Sarah Francis Farmer. This began here with one of these lectures on hope, and like the other lectures, went to publication. This is an eminently accessible and concrete book with practical suggestions that delves deeply into the theology and the understandings of the dynamics of hope, and then delivers it into your ministry with concrete suggestions that you can emulate by two of the greatest scholars that we have working on this topic. And with that segue, which you can buy this book in the Yale Divinity School bookstore, of course. <laughs> with that segue, I want to introduce my partner at the Yale Youth Ministry Institute and at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture Adolescent Faith and Flourishing Program, Dr. Sarah Farmer. We are delighted that you have chosen to spend your afternoon with us. And we know that uh, you have something to offer to our reflections on the theology of joy. And so how many of you preach a sermon at least once a month? Raise your hand. If you preach a okay. So look around. You see how many people raise their hand? How many of you have to teach young people in a youth group or in some other setting? Raise your hand. Look around. Okay, this may be a lesser number, but how many students know that you will probably have to complete a paper before the end of the semester? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, so we should not have any shortage of people entering our competitions. We have three competitions. We have an essay competition, we have a sermon series competition, and we have a curriculum competition. And we want you to join our efforts in thinking about joy and what it means for adolescents to live joyful, flourishing lives. This is not only an opportunity to win up to $2,000, but you also become a project member within this grant. So please consider applying or, or submitting something by the deadline, which is January 31st. If you want to find out more information, please see Jahi in the back. She has flyers. Or if you have a folder, those flyers should be in your folder. You can also look on our website, faith.yale.edu. So how many of you are at least going to think about applying? Let me see your hands. Thank you. You should do it. <laughs> yes. Uh, is this competition on essays open to young people and students? And could they also win $2,000? Absolutely. Get your young people. Get your young people involved. All the, all the, um, all the uh, criteria will be on the website, okay? So I'm uh, now for, um, just delighted to introduce our speakers for today. Robert A. Emmons is professor of psychology at the University of California, Davis, where he has taught since 1988. He received his PhD degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He is the author of over 200 original publications in peer-reviewed journals or chapters and has written or edited eight books, including The Psychology of Ultimate Concerns, The Psychology of Gratitude, Thanks, How Practicing Gratitude Can Make You Happier, Gratitude Works, a 21-day program for creating emotional prosperity, and the little book of gratitude. He is a leader in the positive psychology movement. Dr. Emmons is also founding editor and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Positive Psychology. He is the past president of the American Psychological Association's Division 36, the Psychology of Religion. 
His research focuses on the psychology of gratitude and thankfulness in both you. adults yeah. and yeah. youth and also include the psychology and spirituality of joy and grace as they relate to human flourishing. Professor Emmons speaks regularly at medical and psychological conferences, churches, and public events. Also, Dr. Emmons received research funding from some of the top institutes, such as the National Institute of Mental Health, John M. Templeton Foundation, the We're National Institute for Disability for Research and Rehabilitation. Okay, okay. His yeah. research yeah. has been featured okay. in dozens of popular media outlets, including the New York Times, US Today, US News and World Report, Newsweek, Time, NPR, PBS, Consumer Reports, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and the Today Show. Need I go on? <laughs> but what I have known about him simply through my email exchanges is that he is a genuinely kind and gracious person. In my finally meeting him face to face, I can confirm that gratitude isn't something he just writes about, but something he practices. Need I say we are really grateful that he's chosen to spend time with us today. With Professor Emmons is Mr. Mark Offshore. He serves with Chai Appa as a college minister at the University of the Pacific and Delta College in Stockton, California. While attending UC Davis for his undergraduate degree in biology, Mr. Mark encountered and gave his life to Christ. At that time, he completed his degree and then pursued his ministerial license and has been working with college students ever since. His heart is to see young people discover the life-transforming truth and power of Jesus Christ. Mark is married to his wife, Natalia, and they have one child, Elijah, and currently live in Central California. Would you please join me in welcoming our friends <laughs> to the Yale Youth Ministry Institute. Thank you. I really need to send in a shorter bio, I think, in these things. It's like, you know, the brief bio sometimes. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction. It's always great to be here and to be back. I've been back now, I think it's my fifth time uh, in the last three years, once the uh, Joy Grant began, which is really cool. I've always been so grateful for the hospitality that I've been shown when I've come back. I, I grew up not too far from here, up the road in Newtown, and 18 years I spent there growing up through high school never once uh, stepped foot on the campus of Yale. And now in the last three years, I've been here five times. So I guess I'm making up for all that lost time. Uh, so this is awesome. I love this university and this divinity school and have a great respect for what you're all doing here, the Center for Faith and Culture and the, and the Youth uh, Initiative. It's uh, very close to what I'm passionate about, which is more specific, as Sarah mentioned, gratitude, what it is, why it matters. And how do we get more of it? You know, I spent the last now almost 20 years studying it. And it's interesting when you spend that much time working on a topic. On the one hand, it sounds kind of impressive, right? It's like, whoa, 20 years you've been doing this. That's, you know, you must be, you know, the expert or, or authority. I tell my students that's one way to become an expert on a topic is define your area so narrowly. Nobody else could possibly be considered the expert, you know. Just find something really obscure and narrow and you can carve out your niche for yourself. And on the other hand, in 20 years, it seems like, well, we should have learned a lot more in that time, you know? But 20 years is a very short period of time, especially when it comes to the field of science and what we've learned, because it's an accumulative process, and we, we learn and we grow, we accumulate based upon what people did that came before us. So we're making progress, but really just scratching the surface. I mean, it's just the, the tip of the iceberg. And, what I want to do in the next half hour is just share with you some of that science, but specifically with regard to youth. Why does gratitude matter when it comes to young people? And then Mark, I'm so uh, delighted, excited to have Reverend Mark with us. You're in for a treat today. He's more the going to tell you how to do it. What are some tips and techniques and strategies for working with uh, younger folks? And he's far better at living the grateful life than I've ever been. So he's the right guy to talk about that angle. So uh, without further ado, um, I want to begin actually with a uh, quote from our own or your own Miroslav Volf in his book, Free of Charge, 
Oh, can I go backwards? Yeah. If you notice the, the title, this is what we call the 4G uh, network, you know, flourishing in adolescence. God gives grace, uh, gratitude, and they ran out of G's. But um, found, I do believe that these four are really at the heart of foundations for joy. And there's a clear flow between those as well. Obviously, they, one it builds upon uh, the other. Uh, this particular passage from Miroslav's book, Free of Charge, this is in the context, he's talking about our need, people's need to feel independent, to feel self-sustaining and, and self-reliant, to have you know, pride in our own accomplishments, and a, also a prevailing sense of, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, in, yeah, entitlement that we all kind of have. And he's saying, you know, no, listen, we live in a culture that is stripped of grace. To live in sync with who we truly are means to recognize that we are dependent on God for our very breath and are graced with many good things. It means to be grateful to the giver and attentive to the purpose for which the gifts are given. I mean, this is such an explosive uh, text within a really remarkable book. And this, this is the four G's right there. He covers them all. So we can just stop and we'll go on to Mark, you know. And, we got, it, we got it all covered, but in fact, I want to unpack with you a little bit some of these ideas and the internet connections uh, between these, especially, of course, gratitude, which is what I do as a scientist who studies gratitude, but, but does so uh, from a Christian worldview. And I'm not going to talk too much about gratitude from a more theological basis or mooring, because I really want to get into gratitude and its, and its relevance to youth, okay? so But, but rest assured, I'm, I'm quite aware, and I uh, of the theological backdrop of gratitude, and I've written about that in many of my books, uh, but I want to move more into the research and then the practice of gratitude uh, today. Gratitude is really a two-component process. You know, when you think about what is involved in feeling grateful, there's two steps involved, okay? One is, so you see that picture? Okay, so that's Angela. Last year's, uh, you had a summer retreat, right, Divinity School, uh, down in the, uh, in the shoreline, right? And like really grateful time, right? I saw a picture she posted on her social media. Just beautiful time of feeling kind of uh, a sense of wonder, a sense of awe, a sense of gratefulness just for all the good that was present, you know? And so what did that require of Angela or anyone in a situation when you feel grateful? You affirm that there is something good, right? It's like saying yes to life. Yes, we say yes to life. It doesn't mean life is perfect or that life is free of adversity and suffering and loss because certainly that's part of everyday life. But there, there is things in life to be grateful for. It's saying yes, affirming the good. At the same time, though, we want to recognize the role of the other, the role of the outside, that we didn't deserve or merit or bring about that goodness. It didn't come about because of who we are or what we did. or We didn't earn it or deserve it or merit it, but it's there nevertheless. So it's due to other people, it's due to God, it's due to forces outside of ourselves doing things for us that we could not easily do for ourselves. I think that's the minimum, bare minimum, for what gratitude is. Recognition, the word recognition is very important because we are recognizing at least three things when we are grateful, right? This is kind of the, the mental calculus for gratitude. We recognize that there's a value to the benefit or gift that we've received. We say, this is really special, right? This means something. There's some worth to it. Number two, we recognize that the giver gave it to us intentionally. They, they, they wanted to benefit us. They made our concern their, they made a gift deliberately knowing that we would benefit from it. If they did it accidentally, we're not going to feel grateful to them because they didn't mean it. You know, it, it just was, it was an accident. It wasn't intended for our benefit. And then number three, there was a cost involved to the giver. There was some cost, time, effort, whatever it was. They went out of their way to do something for us. If we put all these elements together, we have gratitude, right? And our gratitude is more intense to the degree to which these variables differ in their intensity, how valuable that benefit is, how much cost we perceive. Someone did something, went out of their way to do something for us. I lost my wallet uh, last time I was on a trip before this one. Uh, I was at a big hotel, and I got out of the cab, and I paid for I was fumbling through credit cards trying to find the right one, you know, to give him so he could do it on his square. I get out of the cab, go into the hotel lobby, I go to check in, and I don't have a wallet, right? I left it in the taxi cab, right? 
Well, nowadays, you don't get receipts that tell you what the cab number is or the cab company. I mean, it was a nightmare, right? You're just getting somewhere. There's no way you can check in. There's no way you can get home, right? I mean, and so I don't know what to do, right? Because I don't handle those kind of situations really well. Being academic, I like things in nice, orderly categories, you know? And that wasn't part of my plan for the trip, right, you know? So I go to, like, you know, I... I go outside and talk to someone. They say, well, go inside and talk to, gave me the name of someone who's like one of the, you know, higher up people. And they said they can look at the security footage because they, they're recording all the vehicles that are dropping people off at the hotel. It's just like on the movies, you know. It's just like, you know, where they can zero in and find you. They can roll back the security tape. They can zero in on the license plate. And basically that's what they did. They eventually found out who the cab was. He came back with my wallet. It was like, you know, all these people, I went, they went to all this trouble to do something for me. I, obviously, I couldn't do for myself. I mean, it was huge cost. It wasn't the money. It was all the hassle that it involved. So that was a great opportunity for gratitude and a great opportunity to um, feel really stupid, right? And I won't do that uh, again. <clears throat> Time before that, I left my laptop on the plane. Anyway, it's like one horror story after another, uh, <laughs> traveling. I like coming to Yale because I never have those problems. It's like, here I remember what I need to do, so it's great. Listen, here's the big question that I began my research with. Is gratitude the key to unlocking and unleashing happiness? Now, I don't have time to get into a long uh, debate and uh, discussion about joy and gratitude, I th joy and happiness, which I think are different. Uh, I think of... When I mean happiness, I mean it more like you mean joy, kind of like a deep, right, sustained kind of soul satisfaction, right, wellness, well-being. Is gratitude the key to that? Is practicing gratitude, awareness of goodness and blessings and recognizing they didn't come to us through our own merit, is that somehow key or foundational for a happy life, a life of flourishing, a life of joy? There's all sorts of ideas out there, been down through the millennia. People have said that gratitude is the secret to life. It's the key to life, one person. The key unlock metaphor is really, really common. Uh, gratitude is the key that opens all doors. That's a good one, right? Um, gratitude is the, uh, the key to living a prosperous life. Gratitude is the most passionate transformative force in the cosmos. One person said that. That's pretty powerful right now, you know. I don't know what that means as a scientist. I mean, I want to do research on it, and I don't take it at face value that gratitude is necessarily this great, powerful uh, elixir that will cure all ills, whatever ails you, you know, practice gratitude, and that'll totally change your life. I want to test that. I want to see if, that, if it delivers on its promise, on its, on its uh, potential. Okay. Well, the research uh, is very massive right now. This is a graphic that shows the increase in studies, research studies on gratitude. I'm sorry, I don't have a laser, so I'll just kind of move over here. This is just in the medical literature in five-year epics from 1965 to the present time. Basically what it shows is that there are more research studies published in the last six or seven years than the previous almost 60 years. So it's really just accelerated. I mean, a really huge increase, explosion of research in the science of gratitude. So much of what we learned, we've learned uh, reasonably uh, recently, which is really, really uh, exciting. Over $10 million has been uh, injected into the science and practice of gratitude. So research funding has been forthcoming. $10 million devoted to exploring the contours layers and levels of gratitude, what it is and why it matters. So it's been really fun to work on a topic that is growing in interest. Public interest is greater than ever before. The science is there. But that doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's like, it's not a, a trendy topic, you know? I wouldn't study something that just because it's like a fad or it's the latest hot topic, it's trendy, you know? Gratitude goes way back in time. We know that from scriptures, from other writings. I mean, this is part of human nature, right? I think, I think it's part of our factory installed equipment. You know, I don't think it's optional kind of an add-on thing, you know, aftermarket. I think it's really part of our DNA. It's who we are. We're, we're born for gratitude. If I can uncover some basic truths about it by using the tools and technologies of today, I mean, that's great. That's kind of where I come from, but I'm interested in it because it says something very basic about human nature part of a perennial wisdom, you know, that we are born for gratitude. We need to be grateful people. 
It's just, it's a need to express that kind of wells up inside of us. And that's exactly what the science is showing. Uh, six different panels, I won't go through all of these, but so many different ways we're learning how gratitude works, why gratitude matters when it comes to emotional. I'm happy, by the way, to send you copies of the slides afterward. You don't need to take, it's actually illegal to take pictures, so make sure you drop off your phones on, I'm kidding. No, it's not. <laughs> take pictures, I do the same thing when I go to talks. Uh, but if you want the slide deck, I'll, you can just talk to me afterward, I can uh, zap that over to you. Uh, so much we're learning about how gratitude works relationally. Gratitude improves uh, social relationships, right? Physically, there's lots of studies on the medical benefits of gratitude. And the list is so long. We'd spend all afternoon just kind of reciting some of the findings on how and why gratitude works. It's like it, you, a person who lives a grateful life, they just reap advantages uh, across the spectrum. Social, relational, emotional, spiritual. I mean, the list goes on and on, even in the context of something like depression or anxiety, because gratitude not only magnifies the good parts of life, but also helps dampen down. I was kidding about the pictures. I said we put away their phones now. It's OK. Keep, keep them going, right? Um, trauma, resiliency. You know that grateful people do better when they're faced with traumatic events, big events or the little everyday suffering, the, the slow drip of everyday suffering, or the big massive upheavals. Gratitude is a way of, of um, finding meaning when things are going poorly, right? When things are going well, it helps us celebrate successes, but when things are going poorly, it helps us find perspective and find some meaning, find the opportunity in the loss, in the adversity. So depression, I mean, people are, have shorter episodes of depression when they're practicing gratitude. Grateful people who are just dispositionally grateful, some people are, they have fewer and shorter episodes of depression. It's, it's a resistance or resiliency factor that improves mental health, relational well-being. I mean, the, the list is basically endless. You really cannot overplay the hand of gratitude. We haven't yet found any domain of life where gratitude makes it worse, you know? There's no way that... Just like the, there's no religions that say it's good to practice ingratitude, right? You know, just be ungrateful. Be, you know, don't bother waste your time giving thanks. Be self-reliant, self-made. We just haven't found a, a, a theology that advocates that. So I think we're on pretty good footing, both from a research as well as from a theological point of view. Now, what about when it comes to kids? Okay. <laughs> you know, one belief is that children are notoriously ungrateful, right? Kind of born, egotistical, focused on me, got to really pound it into them how to become grateful, right? Develop that virtue. You don't come out uh, of the womb speaking words of thanks, of gratitude. Um, whoops. Oh, no. Uh-oh. Look at that, huh? Just trying to get lucky. Um, you know who this is, right? Veruca Salt. Right, the, the prototypical exemplar of a spoiled brat. Right, I want it now, Dad, I want it. She wants the squirrel. Remember, this is in the remake of the Willy Wonka, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, right, with Johnny Depp. And she's got like 40 pets at home, but she wants a squirrel. She wants a trained squirrel, not just any squirrel, right? Wants it, wants it now, right? Lives under a prevailing aura of uh, entitlement. Now, if she were to take our questionnaire, I'm thinking probably score pretty low, you know, on, on gratitude. Right, and so, but a lot of us think this about kids. It's just kind of, they, they are entitled. They, they're spoiled. They don't know what it's like to, to suffer. They don't uh, experience gratitude. They take their blessings for granted and uh, so on. Well, a lot of research now is shown this is not necessarily the case. In fact, I'll give you an example in just a minute, but there are many, many benefits of gratitude in youth. Our research studies have started with kids as young as eight, really. I mean, the, the, the intervention studies that we've done go from eight to 80. But a lot of the research has been with 11, 12, 13-year-olds, and of course, college students, which are just a little bit older kids, you know, 18, 19, and so on, fall within that same basic category. I mean, look at this, just half a dozen findings on the value of gratitude, uh, decreased substance abuse, alcohol consumption, uh, in teenagers, greater levels of protective factors, uh, lower risk, lower levels of risk. So they've showed studies where grateful youth are less likely to get involved in violence, for example, 
Uh, smoking rates are lower. Drug use is lower, right? So they're, they're taking better care of their bodies. They're less likely to engage in health damaging behaviors, more likely to engage in health promotive behaviors. Depression levels are lower, less likely to have eating disorders, uh, as well as p increasing good stuff like meaning in life and a sense of purpose and a sense of generosity. One study was, was a longitudinal study, follow up of kids four years apart found that those who were grateful at time one had the biggest increases in generosity, uh, pro-social behavior, and a decrease in anti-social behavior over that period of time. And a really neat study just came out in uh, applied developmental science showing that grateful parents teach gratitude, in other words, socialize their kids for gratitude through religious involvement. So there's those parents and those families who are involved and engaged in religious communities, they put their kids in, in, in opportunities. They give them opportunities to practice gratitude through structured activities, not always in a spiritual context, but they're frequently talking about gratitude. So they're, they're modeling grateful behavior. You know the old saying that the virtues are uh, they're caught, not taught. They're providing them with opportunities. And as we know, text teachings, traditions of of Christian faith and many others, it's all about gratitude, right? So if you immerse a person in those contexts, they're gonna have these opportunities. They're gonna have spiritual mentors who will model gratitude for them and so on. But now I'm moving into the practices. We'll let uh, Rev. Mark talk about that in just a little bit. Here's a couple of other additional consequences. One is purpose. There's a lot of interest in purpose in life. It's kind of a hot topic right now in psychology, especially youth purpose. Uh, William Damon, some of you may know that name, very distinguished psychologist at Stanford, has been working on purpose in youth for almost 20 years now. And one of the books he wrote was The Path to Purpose. And he talks about the connection between gratitude and purpose, that gratitude is part of kids who live a purposeful life. And not only that, gratitude is something that helps drive purpose. When you feel grateful for what you received, you want to give that back. Right? You, you develop a sense of what he calls a noble purpose, which is doing something useful, not just for oneself, but also outside of the self. It's devoting oneself to something worthwhile, benefit of doing something meaningful to self and of consequence in the world beyond the self, is what he calls a sense of noble purpose. Guess what? Gratitude is a driver of that desire to have and identify with noble purposes. So that's really, really cool and really, really important. It shows that gratitude motivates people to give back. Really important part of gratitude is not just looking for the good and fe feeling good because good things are happening, but also motivates and inspires generosity, giving, forgiving, loving. Right? It all stems from, not all of it, but, but gratitude does that. It drives these pro-social behaviors. People do good as well as feeling good when they are cultivating a grateful outlook on life. I have no idea where, what time we're at, but at some point, someone will hold up a sign saying you're out of time, right? I think I have about 25 minutes left or so. Yeah. This is interesting. Wow. You know, gratitude is much admired amongst high school students. Um, I found this, I was speaking, actually I made a, I made a strategic uh, tactical error. I was giving a talk at a conservative Christian uh, school to parents, and I put up this slide talking about gratitude, sexy, bad idea, you know? It's like, they didn't, they didn't like that so much. I got a lot of nasty looks and so on, but uh, I thought it was a good way to, to frame it anyway. You know, when students got together in a, in a uh, focus group, they're talking, what qualities do you admire in other people? You know, what, what qualities would you admire in a potential, you know, partner, a spouse, right, a husband, a wife, a boyfriend, girlfriend, for that matter? They talk about the usual things, you know, they should be fun and smart and humorous and that sort of thing, but kind, but gratitude was one of those in the pile. It's a, we, we admire grateful people, right? I mean, who wants to be married to an ingrate, right? And so on, you know, it's just not, it's not, a, it's not attractive. Nobody puts that in their description in the personal ads, you know, or if, hey, I'm, I'm ungrateful and so on. It's just, you know, it doesn't go well. We, we don't like that, right? Uh, and so on. It turns out that gratitude, when you combine gratitude with another strength, which is grit, you've heard of grit, right? Another one of these kind of hot topics Right now, Angela Duckworth and others have studied this passion plus perseverance. What studies have shown is that when you combine gratitude with grit, you get some really, really powerful synergistic effects, especially when it comes to something like suicide reduction. One study showed over here that when you have high grit and high gratitude, 
you have the biggest change. This is a decrease in suicidal thoughts over time. This is over, I think, a two-year period in at-risk youth for suicide. So grit is the kind of the, the uh, personal intrapsychic strength, and gratitude is the interpersonal one. So they do a different job. And you combine them, you get really powerful synergistic effect. This was a study which looked at hopelessness, which obviously is the core feature of suicide, and gratitude, and showed that Gratitude mattered the most when hopelessness was high. It's like if the kids are hopeless, but they have gratitude, gratitude can strengthen them and reduce suicidal thoughts. You know, so this is what they call an interaction effect in psychology. So just showing another domain in which gratitude matters when it comes to reduction for uh, suicidal thoughts. Here's a, uh, so Veruca Salt, she'd be at one end of the continuum. Here's a boy, a seventh grader, so about 13 years, 12 years old, and he was asked to write about the meaning of gratitude. And you can see, I think, what he says. My life would not be the same without the people who have shaped and molded my character. It's important to be humble. Remember all the people who helped you get where you are, parents, siblings, or God. Being thankful is being able to let go of ideas of self-importance and instead acknowledge everything in your life that made it better. I mean, just your average you know, 12-year-old boy, right? And so on, actually. <laughs> Actually, most were better, most were more insightful than this. You know I mean? But uh, they do get it. I mean, kids do get gratitude, right? They, they, they know that it's something valuable, that it's beneficial, that it makes life better, right? It's our job to help educate them in that. How do you, you know, create a gratitude literacy uh, for teens, right? Because there's obstacles as well to gratitude, you know? And if we just told the story about how gratitude is good without the obstacles, that's only half the story. Well, I've contemplated why gratitude works, and I've come up with this little acronym, which I like, called ARC. It's easy to remember. You know, you remember Noah's Ark or uh, whatever, Noah's wife, Joan of Ark, you know, that kind of thing, which is a terrible joke. It never works. I don't know why it comes to mind, but the, the, the ARC of gratitude, thank you. The ARC of gratitude is amplify, rescue, and connect, right? So gratitude amplifies like an amplifier or volume uh, knob turns up the, the sound, the volume. Gratitude turns up the good in our lives so that we notice it more. The good becomes bigger and better, brighter, bolder, right? By focusing on those things that we're grateful for, it, it takes on more of an importance. In the background might be negativity, might be complaint, it might be pain, right? Because we know the negativity bias tells us that our minds typically tend to drift toward what's going wrong in our lives. Well, we need a force which counteracts that. And I think that can be gratitude, magnifying the good parts of life, amplifying the sweet parts of life. Same time, of course, we need to be rescued from negativity, from what's the opposite of gratitude? Not ingratitude, but Bernie mentioned some of the other things. Entitlement, resentment, right? forgetfulness, right? all those things, the obstacles get in the way, the roadblocks. We need rescue from those, from ourselves, right? from our own self-focus, which is what gratitude does, because it focuses outward and upward onto other people, or onto God, doing things for us that we can't easily do for ourselves. And then the connective function, when we say thank you, that binds us to other people. When we notice other people are doing things and securing things for us that we could not secure or do for ourselves, that the relationships are forever changed between us and them. It's the, it's the relational strengthening emotion. It gets into the, I call it the emotional spackle. It like gets in the cracks of relationship and seals them up and strengthens them. It's a, it's a bonding agent, so really important for that point as well. Uh, I think I'll, I won't go into this because I want to leave time for Rev. Mark here, but I've also thought about my little book of gratitude, which is my latest. I, I talk about three foundational stones of gratitude. To build gratitude, you have to build it on a strong foundation. I like the metaphor of three stones, and uh, the three I came up with were, were joy, grace, and love, and I think those are a good three, you know, and I won't go into them too much detail right now, but I think this is a good idea because when I put it on social media, that's how I test out ideas. You know, it used to be we rely on you know, uh, journal editors or reviewers or funding agencies to vet our ideas. Now I see how many likes we get, you know, and this one got a lot. So I'm thinking there's probably something that people identify with. But seriously, I think that joy, which is looking for the good, you start with looking for noticing the good, right? So affirming the good. And then grace allows us to receive that good, take in that good. Really hard to do for a lot of people. One of the obstacles to gratitude is that we don't like to receive the good. 
we're pretty good at giving things, but it's much harder to receive a gift often than, than give gifts. And then love is giving back the good. That's that dynamic between receiving, being grateful, and then repaying or paying forward that good. We want to return the good that we've received in some small measure, and then the cycle becomes complete between giving and receiving. So that's all in the little book of gratitude. One of the things we're doing right now is looking at grace. For me, it all comes down to that. I mean, that's foundational, right? That gratitude begins with grace. It's so interesting that, of course, psychology, we don't know what to do with grace because that's an that's a aspect of divinity. It's not an aspect of human beings, right? We can look at what people think about grace and how they you know, talk about it, how they perceive it and receive it or fail to do that, but how would you actually go about studying something which is an aspect, it's a supernatural concept, you know, it's not a natural concept. But, you know, I think there's pretty good grounds to say that uh, grace is the, the root of the gospel, right? And gratitude is a fruit of the gospel. So they, they go together like heaven and earth, like Karl Barth said, right? You know, there's an inherent connection between grace and gratitude. And I found out for me that, you know, without grace, gratitude just became unsustainable. It's like I try really hard to be grateful on my own, but I couldn't do it without recognizing that I was receiving all these things quite free, and quite apart from, in fact, in spite of my own efforts that, that got in the way of gratitude. I just had to receive the good and take it in and absorb it through a process of grace. So we're trying to study this concept of grace, what it is, uh, why it matters. How, how do you study something like that? So we've gotten some research funding to study this in different waves. There's different phases going on. We had one small project, got together with a bunch of uh, people who really think deeply about grace and thought, what exactly is grace? And how would you study this in human beings? You know, and could we, could we um, develop a research program around making sense out of grace? And there's so many different elements and layers to examine. Really interesting topic, you know, what it is and why is it that we, we, we sometimes object to grace. Why is it that we have to qualify it and call it what people call it? You know, like it's, it's radical, it's counterintuitive. It just doesn't make sense in many respects, you know, because life is so conditional. We, you know, feel like we earned our outcomes, right? We earned a paycheck, we earn affection from others. It's like, no, grace says, no, it's all upside down. As you know, the gospel turns everything upside down. And the most obvious example is that of grace, God's unlimited one way love for sinners like you and me, quite apart from anything we do. It's just amazing when you really contemplate that, what it really means. You know, it's like, how would you study that? So we, we wrote, published a paper in a, the, the Top Psychology of Religion Journal. I actually have a few copies if you want one. I'll give it to you. It just came out last month. This is how we define grace. We came up with a definition we think is, is faithful to way, the way most people use the word grace down throughout history. We say it's unconditional acceptance given uh, voluntarily to an undeserving person by an unobligated giver. So you get those key elements, right? Unconditionality, acceptance, voluntariness, uh, unobligated. You're not obligated to give the grace. Anyway, that's how we define it. We debate that amongst ourselves and so on. But we're going to move on and try to, try to measure this perception of grace, the notion that, you know, in some sense, the grace is like gratitude. You can't really achieve it. I mean, you can only receive it, right? And so how do you teach people to become good receivers of grace, that there's some, you know, interesting challenges there when it comes to that, uh, much like there are for, for gratitude. So that's our big question for our future. We're hoping to do a big project now, a, a couple, you know, million dollar project where we invite people to submit proposals to study grace theologically, psychologically, and also philosophically. And so actually one of those right now we're working on is to invite people doing dissertation research, qualitative dissertations, where they're going to administer structured interviews uh, just of, of people in different faith traditions to figure out how they think about grace. How do they perceive grace? What are the qualities of it? So we can learn more about it through a focused qualitative study and then go move into more quantitative work down the road. So Hey, anybody here interested in that? You know, in the Divinity School, a dissertation on grace, you know, uh, stay tuned because there'll be some monies available for that, hopefully in the next year uh, or so. Okay, when we choose gratitude, we find that gratitude is, is transformative. Gratitude heals, energizes, and transforms lives in so many different ways, but again, I think it really starts with a perception of receiving, basically, you know, 
something that we didn't earn or didn't deserve. And how do you communicate to that? That's the challenge, right? See, the challenge with some of these gratitude exercises, they just, for a lot of people, especially teenagers, they just seem so frivolous or so corny. They seem kind of like boring. Let's go around the table and count our blessings, right? Okay, you know, let's write a thank you letter. Seriously? Right? And so on. Uh, you know, even babies are bored by, you know, by thank you notes. So a friend of mine, Kali, he, he, claim, he claims his son listen, wrote his first gratitude thank you letter at age three months. You know, I'm a little skeptical, but uh, I think you know, it's one of those cases where there is some gratitude early on. The, the, the capacity for it is there. How do we build, how do we bring that out, right? How can we be agents of a grateful awakening in our children, in our youth, in our students, right, in the people that we deal with? I mean, that's the key question, because the person who's funded most of all the research on gratitude, most of all what we do, and funded, you know, the joy and all the stuff, all the good research is being done, all these important spiritual realities. The vast majority of it comes from the generosity of the Templeton Foundation, Sir John Templeton. For him, it was all about thanksgiving. Not so much gratitude. He said, thanksgiving is more of an active word, right? The giving of thanks. Thanksgiving, it's an action word, right? It's not just feeling grateful, it's expressing it in action. Becoming aware, but then sharing that, declaring that. He said, I love this quote. If there is any day in our life which is not Thanksgiving Day, then we are not fully alive. Right? That's the trick, is how do we get the, our youth, right, ourselves, to be alive with gratitude? That's the challenge, right? So I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, Reverend Mark, he's, like I said, he's got a much better resume when it comes to living the grateful life uh, than I do. Despite what, uh, you know, Sarah's very kind. But my wife, if she was here, she'd tell you. And she told me that. She said, like, how is it you're supposed to be this big expert on gratitude? You're like, you're the, you're the least grateful person that I know. And uh, I think there's quite a bit of truth to that. You know, gratitude is a journey that we're, we're on, you know. And, and the problem with studying these things is you realize just how short you come, right? That you can know about a topic, you know, uh, academically and cognitively, but to, to put that into performance, that's where the obstacles lie. That's the great challenge. So, so Rev. Mark's got some really cool ideas that he's going to share with us right now. Check, we on, there we go, loud and clear. Hey, Dr. Emmons, um, uh, I was entitled to like 20 minutes, but you know what, I'm grateful for the 11 that I have now. <laughs> Praise the Lord, y'all see what I did there? Um, super excited to be here, uh, first time at, uh, at Yale. Um, and uh, Dr. Emmons, we uh, were walking uh, the campus and, and checking out some of the different buildings. And I was just amazed, uh, just the environment, the atmosphere is incredible. I was telling Dr. Emmons, I wish I studied harder than high school. Maybe I could have, you know, got here and, and studied. But uh, anyways, I ended up at UC Davis, which is another great school. That was a miracle. You don't believe in miracles. I had a 2.6 GPA at a junior college. Got into UC Davis. Um, and uh, there, uh, I wanted to be a pharmacist because my mom was tired of me selling drugs. So I said, Mom, let me do it legally. You know what I'm saying? We're going to be good. And uh, anyways, I went to school at Davis. Uh, to be, I wanted to be a pharmacist. And uh, uh, anyways, I, uh, long story short, uh, I had an encounter with Jesus. There was a ministry group uh, called Chi Alpha there. And uh, they, a bunch of uh, college students, um, they led me to the Lord. Uh, taught me how to pray, read my Bible. Uh, fell in love with Jesus. Uh, graduated with a degree in biology. It's at my mom's house collecting dust. Uh, I'm a minister now and uh, uh, work with uh, college students uh, since 2010. Uh, and so, super, yeah, come on, give a hand clap to the Lord one time. Yes. Okay, when I first went to Davis, uh, a college student, um, uh, you know, I, I'm out on my own. I don't have my mom with me cooking me meals anymore. So I was, and I didn't have a lot of money. You know, you're a college student. You know, I know we got some students in the back here. You don't have a lot of money for your culinary cuisines, right? So you just got a cup of noodles and top ramen, right? <laughs> And if you want to dress it up, you know, you're taking out a girl, you might get some frozen uh, veggies from, from the grocery store, put it in there, you know, get some marinated chicken, chop it up. That's date night right there. That's next level, right? That's the extent of how good our, our food was there, you know, during, during my time as a college student. Well, you compare that with going back to mom's house for, you know, uh, breaks and holidays. So I go back to my mom's house 
and it's a straight up feast. I mean, she's sending me back to school with two weeks worth of Tupperware, right? So I'm eating good, right? And I didn't realize that my whole life growing up, that's how my mom cooked all the time. And uh, here's our quick practical uh, gratitude point number one. You, could, you don't need to go on a top ramen, couple noodles diet to be grateful for the food, right? Uh, you could br- practice gratitude now, not later, right? And so my whole um, application uh, to that is uh, send a gra- gratitude text. I know young people, they love the text message. There's this popular thing on social media where uh, if somebody's interested in somebody else, they'll try to slide into the direct message. I don't know if anybody has heard that. I got a one laugh that you understand. But, but we know how to communicate in, in different ways. So, hey, my challenge to young people, and this is what I try to do too, uh, send a text to somebody that I'm, that I'm uh, grateful for. And I put up an example. Um, there it is, hashtag the struggle is real to the mom's cuisine right there. Just to see you could be grateful for both. Um, okay, so I sent this one. That's my wife and baby boy. Um, and this is what I sent to my wife the other day. I said, hi, baby, exclamation point. Super grateful for you. I love you. How you raise our baby boy in such a fun-filled manner. He's growing up so happy. Love you. That's my gratitude text. And she loved that. I put the winky face, but that's for a whole different reason and purposes. That, uh, <laughs> gratitude is sexy. Come on, somebody. Okay, seven minutes. So um, my challenge is uh, send a gratitude text on the daily. Encourage your young people. They're on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, text message, email. Write a note to a teacher that they're grateful for. uh, And start that in your ministries. Uh, Do like a gratitude uh, competition. See which kid can write the most gratitude texts and and do it that way. Um, This has totally changed my life uh, Probably last two months, we've been in between homes, and somebody said, like, well, uh, so you're homeless? Uh, so technically, uh, my wife, we sold one house. We, we, we just got in the other house yesterday, so I'm not there to move. We hired professional movers, all that stuff. So my wife is good. We got some friends, all that stuff. But anyways, we've been living uh, at friend's house in one room with my wife and baby. Um, and, uh, and I'll be honest with you guys, like, being grateful has changed everything for me because r- when I lay my head down on the ground my wife and baby took my blanket and now I got the baby's blanket and I don't even cover my whole body but I'm just laying there at night I say you know what uh Lord I'm grateful you know that we have a place over our head and now you know it's not even about getting a house anymore you know that could be a goal or or something that we we hope to to uh, attain but hey I'm grateful for having a roof over my head wherever I'm at and so uh, and that yeah so um that's how it applied to me. Um, let me move forward. Let's take this one step deeper, can we? Um, how about writing a, a gratitude letter to the Lord? Um, something that you're grateful that God has done in your life. Uh, the thing I get with co- uh, college students, young people, they don't know how to articulate their faith. Well, this is a great way to do it because, hey, has God done something in your life? Has he blessed you with something? Has he delivered you for something? Anything. Uh, and they can write about that. And uh, here is Psalm 45, one. It says, my heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. David, he would write in the Psalms, he'd he'd show his gratitude unto the Lord. Um, And get creative. Young people, they're all about creativity. They got to express themselves, you know? They can't, you can't put them in the box. Um, You got to let them be creative, write poems, write raps. And I might just do a rap right now, is that okay? I know that's a little extreme, but let me just do a rap real quick, because if y'all don't know, I do rap, that's my night job. Man, we're talking about gratitude. So you know how to change my attitude. See, Jesus, he ain't mad at you. He just want to change your altitude. All right? See, Christ raised us up, seated us in heavenly places. So I'm going to be grateful for every occasion. Life without him, it left me so vacant. He wants you to flourish. See, Skip, that's a true statement. I'm not going to drop it. It's an expensive microphone. Last thing, I got four minutes. We're good to go. Um, be creative in how you express your gratitude. I think that communicates with young people. They'd love that. Get behind that. Um, and rap is a big thing nowadays, too, young people. Okay. Um, last thing, I don't think it, it, it's one thing to articulate your gratitude to others, but I think it's another thing, uh, like Dr. Emmons was mentioning, to, to put it into practice. Um, 
Uh, one time I went to San Diego, which is uh, just an amazing place in California, um, and uh, we're blessed in California to have really good Mexican food, you know, and the closer you get down to the border, the better it is. And uh, so anyways, I went to go visit my best friend in San Diego, and he knows all the taquerias. I mean, if you get a chance to, to uh, you know, I don't know if you've, you've been able to have some Mexican food, and no, I'm not talking about Chipotle or Taco Bell. This is just authentic. So I'm going to San Diego just straight up to eat, okay? I know that's probably gluttonous, sinful, but hey, um, that's how, we, hey, but you know what? Jesus broke bread and ate fish. Come on, somebody. I'm re- up here rebuking myself. So um, uh, we, I went down there to San Diego to eat the best Mexican food. That was the purpose of the trip, to hang out with my best friend and, and eat some uh, 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 Mexican food. Well, there was an opportunity there that my friend, who was involved in this ministry, and he said, hey, uh, a group of us, we're going to go serve at the uh, homeless shelter, uh, and uh, we're going to serve food uh, to the less fortunate. And uh, so I said, hey, you know, I'll just roll with them. We show up. Everything changes for me because I went to San Diego to be served, but there I found myself serving, and that changed everything for me because it, it grew my heart for, for people uh, in less uh, fortunate circumstances, and uh, it made me appreciate and, and be grateful for, for what I have. I felt I came into San Diego entitled, but I left grateful because of that result. So my, my last action step, if you want to call it, find someone in a lower position than you and serve them. Uh, we could always we could always find even young people can find somebody to go and serve and and uh, and uh, help them out and so um, that's my uh, three takeaways uh, in, in uh, practicing gratitude real simple uh, do a gratitude text send that out uh, do that daily weekly find somebody to, uh, to send a gratitude text to um, write a gratitude letter unto the Lord uh, and then also find somebody t- in a lower position than you and serve them so that's it for me. Um, grateful for you guys, and thanks so much. I'll pass it back to Skip. Phil Love, Managing Director, Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Here it is. <laughs> Bob, has your research indicated any consistent difference in levels of gratitude in terms of stages of life, seasons of life? Yes, uh, very interesting. Just in terms of like chronological age, uh, there, there shows uh, a clear increase as a person gets older, their levels of gratitude go up in a pretty clear stepwise fashion. So the most grateful people uh, tend to be older individuals. Okay? And whether that because it correlates with spirituality or religious involvement, uh, that might be one factor. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but that it's, it's clear, though. So the group that is the most challenged are just these ones we're talking about is, is, is adolescents, especially guys. So women have an easier time with gratitude than men, and then older compared to younger. Uh, so exactly correct. O- older? A relative term, right? <laughs> right. So as we, what happens is that People, I think, learn a coping that gratitude is, that life is full of successes and it's full of failures, it's full of victories and it's full of losses, right? And that it just comes with a spiritual maturation. I think gratitude is one reflection of that. But I think you see that trend for a lot of the spiritual strengths or virtues. Humility is a good example. Forgiveness, another one. Most likely hope and optimism. I'm not quite so sure about that one. Uh, But you do generally see a greater... Uh, spiritual maturation trajectory where you see an increase in these virtues and gratitude is probably the best example of that. And the people that write to me uh, because I've written you know, some popular books oh, typically are older individuals who have, you know, they've tried and tested different worldviews and philosophies and practices and what for them it's like it comes down to gratitude. You know, gratitude as a way of life, not just saying thanks as a habit but a, a deeply ingrained way of looking at life. And that's become their life philosophy. And you see very few, you know, 17-year-olds who, who will acknowledge that because, you know, they haven't had the experiences yet. But we, we get that. One of the benefits of getting a little bit older. There are some. Other questions? A second. At the other end of the spectrum, <laughs> age-wise. Speaking for the four-month-olds. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, I actually know a few people who've had a lot of suffering in life. Um, they're actually a little older, um, and they have a lot of resentment. Mm. And I was wondering, how can you encourage, especially as a, a person who's younger, to, to a, an older person or, or to anyone, um, how can you encourage gratitude and, and bring it out without, without 
kind of uh, touching painful chords and bringing right. up resentful resentment and unhappiness. Right, right, right. In people. So the, 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 the other side of the equation, of course, is uh, gratitude in the context of suffering, resentment, uh, and there could be some uh, ops there could be some resistance to it, right? You know, sure you're grateful, but you know, look at my life, right? If I was in your position, I'd certainly be grateful too, right? But yet we know from our research that many people have been through you know terrible catastrophes and um, you know victims of you know horrible things happening to them. They're like the most grateful ones we've studied. Right. Now, maybe they were like that before, and you know, they had that foundation. They had gratitude as part of their psychological immune system. So they're able to you know, transform that adversity into some opportunity you know, for growth. Hi, that was funny, right, what I said? Yeah. Um, uh, but I think others do go in the direction where it just, it just hardens them, and they're unable to conjure up any basis for gratitude. So I think a lot of times when, when we want to help encourage gratitude in people, whether it's spouses, family members, students, youth we work with, a lot of times a very useful perspective is um, consider the opposite, right? Think about the opposite end of the spectrum. So we'll get them, ask them, talk about resentment or entitlement, you know? Do you think life is better for people when they have resentments or when they feel entitled? So you, you kind of get them to, almost in like a Socratic way, point out the, the, the harmfulness of like resentfulness or ingratitude or a culture of complaining. We live in a culture of complaint. Do you see the harm that causes in relationships? And everyone will say, yeah, 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 you know? And then it's like that will open them up to a, to a more grateful uh, lens, right? An appreciative lens. Sometimes you have to go with what it's not and get over those obstacles. Then you can start to go toward what it actually is. Before we take another question, I want to make sure that all of you who are here know that we have with us Carolyn Harden Engelhart, who is the director of the Ministry Resource Center Library that is part of the Yale Divinity School Library. And all these books around the margin here have been brought by her from the extraordinary collection that's in that Ministry Resource Library. And if you speak with her a little bit uh, after the lecture, I know she'd be glad to share with you uh, books, resources, games, programs, videos, an incredible collection for working pastors. All right, other questions? Yes, sir, Leon. Thank you. Bob, um, so I'm, I'm remembering a concept that I heard about uh, taking a, a psychology class about positive affect and negative affect, yes. basically people who you know, the way I remember it, tend towards better mood, more gratitude, people who tend towards worse moods and less gratitude. Um, I'm also thinking um, of, a, of, a, of a, a particular person from my church um, and just wondering how, how in relationship, right? Because I think, I mean, I think we can all think of kind of like some folks in our life who, who uh, you know, maybe seem to be struggling with resentment and, 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 and gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the first question is, has your research on gratitude kind of emphasized, underscored that, borne that out, um, that there are some people who are kind of more naturally, right. like not just because of age, right. not just right. because of you know, necessarily circumstances, but almost a predisposition. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, are, are, there, are there things that can be particularly helpful if there are people with a predisposition towards resentment or entitlement um, that can be kind of like particularly yes, thank helpful? thank you. I mean, that's a great question. I mean, you don't even have to limit it to that because there's other personality uh, characteristics that will affect people's, let's say, openness to gratitude or the way they want to express gratitude. So take something that something like, you know, a basic difference like introversion, extroversion, right? The introverts, like, they're more private, right? And more reflective, and they're less at ease in a big crowd, a big gathering, right? So the way they express gratitude will likely be very different from an extrovert, right? Now, so I'm more of an introvert. Reverend Mark here is more of an extrovert. Like, how we express it is different. I might be happy writing in a journal, but he wants to get out there and, and declare and broadcast gratitude, you know, through some of the means... He's, you know, uh, talked to us about. And those are both valid ways of doing it. It's just kind of what's more in accordance with your fundamental personality traits, right? 
So, but the fact is that you know, gratitude is, is built in no matter what our other personality traits are. The capacity for it is there. Other stuff can get in the way of that. So if our temperament by nature tends toward more the negative, pessimistic, gloomy side, you know, the Eeyores of life, and there are people like that, they actually are the ones who have the most to gain by practicing gratitude. And studies show that the ones who start lower on positive affect, they actually show the biggest effect through our gratitude journaling experiments. Right? The ones who are already pretty happy, I mean, they can sustain their happiness, their joy, but they're all kind of up there already. So it's just kind of an additional booster for them. It's less of a, of a changing transformational moment than it is for the people who are, who are lower down. So there's more opportunities for the ones who are lower, but it also is a bit more work it, because it doesn't come easily or naturally. You can't just say, okay, boom, you know, uh, wake up and, and practice gratitude and, and find the effect. Sometimes it's, it, you have to go from the, you know, the minus 10 to the zero point before you can go from the zero to the plus 10. So it's getting away, getting away from those things which are getting in the way of their gratitude, identifying those. And can we you know, work on those first? And I say a really good exercise, just be very practical, very concrete. And I start the little book of gratitude with an exercise where I say, all right, think about a person who did something for you in the last day or two, went out of, your, went out of their way to help you out, right? They didn't have to do it, right? But they did it anyway. They gave you a benefit, a favor, a kindness. So and anyone can come up with that, no matter how depressed or how negative or entitled or whatever this person is, everyone can think of someone who has been kind to them, if not yesterday, last week, last month, some point in their life, right? And they start with that and say, see, they didn't have to do that, but they went out of their way. And then did you, did you want to give back? And so that opens the door for discussion uh, on gratitude and giving back and can, you know, a lot of times just be that, be that switch that turns on the system for them to a, to a better way of living, to a more grateful way of living. And even they'll start to come up with a gratitude list in a journal that'll get bigger and bigger uh, as they focus more and more on what they, it just has to see, it seems to have that effect, that snowball effect at first. That is just because it's a way of, it's a way of seeing that alters our gaze. And once that gaze is altered, it's hard to go back to the way the life was before. But yeah, there are some who have more challenges. Uh, my, name, my name is Anderson Curtis, and um, I came here today to, to uh, increase and enhance my own gratitude. I work with boys in an inpatient drug treatment facility, 12 to 18. Mm. So when you showed the slide about the hopelessness, yes. um, you know, I deal with a lot of different traumas. Um, so, uh, you know, thinking about group facilitation and getting them to turn that gaze, like to look at what they could be grateful for, um, is very challenging. Yeah. Um, that's why I'm here, because, you know, I, I don't have all the answers and I can use as much help as I can get with that. But um, the engagement part for them and um, just, could you speak to like how to um, sure maybe get them to look at something a little different? Yeah. Like I like the thing about the list. I mean, you know? sometimes we get hung up on the language, on the discourse, and we want to use the, the language of, of gratitude and gratefulness and thankfulness, right? And it is true. I mean, the more grateful people, they, they kind of process reality that way. And, you know, you, they talk about being blessed and being fortunate and being graced. And, and they're, they're using, they're trafficking in the language of gratefulness. For others, these are all foreign. You may as well be speaking a foreign language, right? Because they don't think of themselves that way. And you can't, you can't have them engage necessarily in like a counting blessings task because they, they'll wind up counting how they've been harmed in life. You know, if you have them engaged in this mental calculus, right, the harm will always be greater than the, the burdens will always be greater than the blessings. So it's not necessarily, I think a really good way is just focusing, just thinking about in a group setting, you can have just people reflect on good things that have happened recently, right? Whether it's the help they receive from someone, uh, something went better than they thought it was going to, so what surprising thing happened, right? So a kind of a creativity and flexibility on how you introduce the gist of the, right, the stuff that might wind up being in a gratitude journal or list for someone else might just be something that switches their focus to how they've been harmed or, you know, people have, you know, disrespected them or they have this sense of exaggerated deservingness to think about what good have I received, you know, that I didn't necessarily do anything to to, to merit or to obtain. But it happened quite apart from that, right, or in spite of that even. And so you just shift the needle a little bit from the resentment 
to the gifts. Just use the language of gifts, right? You don't even have to use gratitude, right? What gift did you receive? Use gift in a very, and they can come up with that, right? They, they want to talk about that. You give them the power to decide how to identify what discourse they want to use, right? So, so here, family, if I had a bunch of teenagers at home and I only have two and one's grateful, one's not, so I'm not the best expert, but it <laughs> turns out they're with kids, right? I'd say, okay, what, what do you guys think is the best gratitude practice? Here, let's develop one as a family. We know that this brings benefits. Hey, you know, you'll get a better job down the road. You'll make more money if you're grateful. Actually, you might because that drives productivity and happiness and all the good things associated with better income. So, but what do you think is a good gratitude exercise for us to engage in as a family? Because kids are independent. They're developing. And they don't want to go along with mommy and daddy's plan for gratitude. What, what do you think is the best strategy or tactic or, you know, here's Thanksgiving Day, our annual gratitude holiday. <laughs> what a great opportunity that is for them to have a say in what the gratitude practice should be in the family. It might not be something that we endorse, that we go along with, but it increases their buy-in, they get on board with it, and that's, that's all it takes. And, you know, they need people like you to, that believe in them, that give them a mentor, that they can look back and write you a gratitude letter at some day. Maybe they've already done that, right? And say, thank you for believing in me. You become their beacon of gratitude. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to dovetail on, on what you were just asking for the group that you work with, perhaps um, using language like what went well mm -hmm. uh, would work and doing something like a gratitude box um, or cheers for peers box uh, might be helpful where you can put in um, little slips of paper talking about something that went well or that they're grateful for that day or that week. And then if you have meetings with the kids, you can open up the box or the jar and read those slips of paper so that they can share it with each other. And they can be anonymous or they could write their names on them, whatever works. Um, but that might be a way to help facilitate that uh, yeah. for the kids. Very concrete, you know. I mean, there's a, a, an assignment, it's called the, the Two Minute Miracle, where you're actually you're asked to go out and express gratitude to someone. That's like in your, in your universe, in your sphere, but they're like behind the scenes. It's somebody that normally doesn't get any notice, any attention, any acclamation. Find that person and say, thanks for doing a good job. So it becomes very, very behavioral. You know, sometimes the attitude change follows behavior change. There's a whole, you know, psychology behind that. You do something first, then you actually come to believe it, right, you know? Why churches want to get people plugged in right away and get them active in doing stuff, because then they actually wind up adopting the faith after a while. Well, same thing with the, like, gratitude, right? So there's a great example of um, uh, this football player at Stanford University, and he's given this assignment. Go out and do something that will make you happier. It's like you could choose whatever activity you want. Be kind to someone, be nice, do something for yourself, do something for other people. He wants to express gratitude, right? So he's in his dorm room, and he looks down, he sees the, the lady who comes once a week, and she changes all the, the laundry, the bedding, the sheets in the dorm for him, right? He goes down there, right? And he says, excuse me, are you the person who comes every week to change my sheets? And she says, yes, right? And she doesn't know why he's talking to her, because nobody ever does. She's ignored most of the time. He said, I just want to say how much I look, I look forward to getting back into bed when I get home on Tuesday nights and climbing into this bed with these crisp, clean sheets. Thank you very much. And she looks at him, and she said, you know, I've been doing this job for 10 years, and you're the first person who's ever thanked me. It's like this one beautiful moment. She starts to cry, actually. And, like, he starts to cry. He's, like, six, six, 300 pounds, right? And he starts to, like, you know, blubber there, right? Because it's a moving moment. It took him two minutes to go down and say thank you. And so we can express that in so many different ways, different people. And that can be, you know, that can trigger. That could, that could be a, a spark which sets off a more of a, a way of looking at life through this grateful lens. Is people like to receive gratitude, right? Uh, I like to receive it. I like to express it. I see benefits on both ends of the giver and the receiver. Hello, my name is Paul. Glad uh, to hear both of your talks. Thanks, Paul. Wanted to ask about how um, the practice of gratitude contributes to lower levels of violence. You made mention of that in your talk, and would love to hear more about I that. I mean, it was one, uh, there's not a lot of studies. There's one study conducted by um, a National Institute of High School Students and found that gratitude was related to getting to less fights. Uh, I think through having better peer relationships, that was a big part of it, so kind of the, the social relational benefits. Um, 
it also found that uh, there was a, a correlation between gratitude and not bringing weapons to school. Now, that's not a variable I would have thought to look at, right? You bring weapons to school, but, you know, some places they do that, right? And so on. And the, the grateful kids were less likely to do that. So that they're not putting themselves in a position where that's likely to happen. And a part of it, I think, is some of the same processes that drive the health benefits. That is, you, when you see your, your life, your health as something which is gifted to you, you want to take better care of it, right? You want to preserve and protect that, you know? And so I think some of it is that there's just where they identify their life, their purpose, why they're here. And so they're less likely to engage in risky behaviors outside of that. And gratitude is one of those factors which drive that perception and then drive that being in those situations, which, I mean, admittedly, sometimes you can't avoid. But you can do things which increase or decrease your likelihood of that happening. And it is interesting how gratitude is one of those, because the interpersonal strength drives a lot of that choices about, you know, who to hang out with and um, uh, relational, right, aspects of everyday life that seem to be linked to uh, interpersonal violence, at least. Grateful people take less risks, you know, when they're driving on the freeway. They're more likely to go to the doctor. They, they want to maintain what they've received because they, they, are, they are cherishing that. And so that sometimes is enough just to give them that kind of positive motivational force, right? Uh, I think that moves them in that direction. Um, I had a, a question about, you actually touched on it a little bit in response to his question, but it was, my question was about decision making and gratitude. I feel like gratitude helps me feel at peace with where I am. Yes. Um, and sometimes people are like, well, you, you know, you should be grateful for your job and maybe that job isn't a good fit or something like that. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how to like look at a situation gratefully and honestly and also like what you hinted at about being able to you know, because I'm grateful, I'm going to do, make this choice or that choice. Right, you know, I mean, uh, one of the, I think, beauties that gratitude not only in terms of reducing things like depression and addiction and other afflictions, but also anxiety, right? Uh, because when you approach life from a grateful lens, you're, you're seeing security. You're seeing that there is sufficiency, that I have enough right now. Maybe, you know, it might not be perfect, but it's sufficient. So you're operating from a frame of abundance, which is very different from operating from a position of deficiency or insufficiency or focusing on what is lacking versus what you actually have. And, and most of us kind of go to one of those two extremes, whether we're aware of it or not. We kind of adopt one of those two um, you know, frameworks or worldviews. And so the grateful one says that, you know, yeah, this is not perfect, but uh, there's sufficiency here right now. And there's a sense of security that comes from that. I think just giving thanks to others creates a sense of security, right? It means that I can rely on other people to do things for me. I don't have to do the job by myself at work, right? I can accept help from others. Uh, it's not all riding on me. I mean, that's very freeing, right? You know that, you know, uh, you, can, you can take the help of others, that it's not totally up to you. That would be very burdensome, right, to think that. So a lot of ways that, you know, gratitude can make life lighter. And I think it just creates freedom for a person when they look at life through the grateful, grateful uh, lens or grateful framework. Mark, you want to add anything? You, do any of this? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think you could be grateful but not content. Mm. So I think, you know, if you want to venture out to something else, I think you can still remain grateful and strive for something else. One of, the, one of the kind of myths that many people hold is that if you're grateful, you're kind of complacent. You know, I've written on the myths of gratitude. You're like almost kind of passive. or It's like, you know, I'll just, this is good, this is fine. Uh, you know, uh, kind of a lethargy that it entails. And there's no evidence of that, right? I mean, in the research, the gratitude inspires people to make the changes, inspires purpose. People become more giving and generous and, and uh, forgiving, engaged in pro-social action. Gratitude moves them to do that and to make changes when they need to make changes. Yeah. Bob, uh, I have a question relating to groups. Most of the folks here are working with a community or working with a youth group or a congregation. And uh, you touched on this, but much of the vocabulary has been, if you do this, you will be more grateful. And I'm yes. sure your studies have also touched on, how does a culture, mm. how does a community habit, how does a community culture that transcends every individual change the nature of the community and change the nature of the individuals in the community. So I'd like to have a little reflection from you on the communal aspects, the cultural aspects of transformation mm -hmm. through gratitude. Mm -hmm. And Mark, 
do you have any tips or suggestions for us of how a youth group, yes, they do their journal or they do their texts or they do their letters, but are there group dynamics that are cultivated as a group that change the culture? Yeah, I mean, uh, the context, I think, is important because it, it creates those niches, those opportunities, right, to enact these qualities through role models, through the sharing. You have the uh, upward spirals uh, that happen when you have expressions of gratitude because you have receivers, you have givers, you have gratitude, and you want to keep paying forward, paying uh, back that goodness, right? So I think it can happen in a top-down fashion as well as a bottom-up fashion. Now, being a psychologist, a study, my area was personality psychology, which is about the person, the individual. I just kind of approach things from more of a uh, kind of a bottom-up uh, fashion. Maybe that's kind of why my vocational test when I was in high school said that psychology was my number one choice. Back then, I didn't even know I wanted to be a psychologist. And then, like, ministry was number two, right? Because maybe I thought that change had to come from within the person. If I thought it could be legislated, I probably would have become a politician, right? Because I think it's more about the individual. I think it works that way more so. And then it starts to reverberate through the community. But, I mean, I've seen different um, uh, movements within, within groups, organizations, communities, neighborhoods, towns. A lot of them will adopt, like, you know, we want to be the most grateful town in America or grateful city. And how do we do that, right? How do we build opportunities for people through workplaces, through schools, through healthcare, through ministry, churches, right? All of these can have a stake. All these can be stakeholders in creating opportunities that will value, you know, personal as well as corporate expressions of gratitude. So, I mean, just there's really no limits to this. Right? It's just being in those contexts, the, these niches, the parents, the grateful parents create these grateful niches for their kids to express gratitude, to have these opportunities and not leave it to chance. You know, because a lot of things you leave it to chance, what happens, right? It just kind of withers, right? It dries up. So providing the opportunities, the role models, encouraging, rewarding, reinforcing, that's what happens in communities. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, um, and uh, also I add, gratitude is conta it's contagious, you know, when you see somebody who's uh, grateful, you want to be around them, and so I think at the, uh, the, the top level, leadership, in, in, you know, your leader in your church, um, just to practice it uh, continuously there around young people, you know, they, they receive that, they see what you do, how you do it, I've been to churches where, you know, the pastor or the leaders are kind of unapproachable, you know, and, uh, but I've been to other churches where the pastor, he'll be out amongst, uh, you know, amidst the congregation and, and greeting people. And I think that's the, that's the um, typical case. But, uh, but anyways, yeah, to be like that, I think it takes a certain level of intentionality to, uh, uh, to practice that mm -hmm. from the top level staff. You can be uh, like we, we like to call as being intentionally organic, um, you know, to still come in with, hey, we're going we're gonna to practice gratitude with our students and show that, but we're not going to do it in a way that, you know, is kind of... Um, uh, academic, you know, uh, or textbook, you know, process is going to be more relational. And I think um, uh, your people will catch on to that and they'll want to be like that and do that. So I think, yeah, and the, the, make it fun. Yeah, I think make it the lit, common, yeah, common so. thread of success in any of these movements, whether it's families, neighborhoods, communities, workplaces, nations, whatever, is that you can't require gratitude, right? I mean, it, it, it requires freedom. You got to be free to express it and to uh, receive it. And so it, it becomes, a, you offer it as an opportunity. You know, here are several ways of looking at life or several ways of, they've done this with educational settings. Here are different ways to approach the curriculum. And one of them is, is gratitude. Be grateful for what you've learned and see it that way. Use, they use the language of gratitude. That's kind of like a learning technique, a pedagogical device. And they find that has you know, massive positive effects in people's uh, curiosity and, and wanting to learn and discuss the material and getting greater school engagement. It, but it, it's like a choice. You can choose that from like a menu of options. And then you don't have to worry about the, the imposition of gratitude because, you know, like you, can't, you can't require, you can't force, you can't exact it from someone. But it has to be an invitation. I think that's when it seems to work the best. All right, we have time for one or two more questions, all right? Hello, thank you again for being here with us. I, as we were sitting down and just processing, I'm thinking also of cultural um, norms and also difference. Um, for example, I think about um, my church um, where there's a large Latino, Latina population um, who are 
immigrants to this country, and, and gratitude is something that is constantly seen in pretty much just everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think of narrative. For example, um, recently with the hurricanes that took place, and we were just talking about this on the way here, you know, um, those of us who were here in the mainland seeing the effects of Irma and Maria, we were like shocked and we're freaked out and we're grieving. And right. then when we speak to our family, the first thing they say is, we thank God we're alive. Mm -hmm. You know, or, or, or thank God for this and thank God for that. You know, just yesterday, Southeastern Connecticut got hit or two days ago with a big storm and people are still without light and people are, you know, forget about this crisis, right. you know, for two days, <laughs> right. you know, and people right. are still without power and water in the islands. Right. And still we hear hear them and we talk to them and it's really much like God is good you know we're alive you know the, the narrative is, is different and I share that because I wonder is there um, in your research are, are you looking at other cultures and communities and how gratitude is um, displayed seen um, you know shared um, well, Dad, you had another question we were both talking about we're tag teaming can I give her the mic can I give her the mic Cultural differences Cultural. in how we see gratitude and how, um, you know, that's shared among uh, different communities. Like, for example, the U.S. versus uh, South or the West, uh, Western Asian population. Right, yeah. Some yeah. of the comparisons have been with Asian uh, nations and uh, others. It, there's, it's very preliminary. Uh, a lot of it surrounds kind of like how gratitude is, is seen and interpreted, whether it, whether it uh, goes along with a sense of feeling indebted. And some, that seems to be a, a fundamental distinction. Some people, when they feel grateful, whether it's because of culture or other factors, for them it's more of a sense of feeling in, uh, there's a debt to be discharged. I need to pay back that as soon as possible. It almost has kind of an unpleasant connotation to it. You know? In others, there's no sense of indebtedness. It's just, you know, it's just all positive, all pleasant. Uh, some, it's more... Uh, um, restricted to families, it's it's deeper within the family. Others, it's it's broadcast more uh, outside the family. So a, a difference, and I think a lot of it is, is, is cultural. It may be it may be religious differences. It's hard to um, isolate the the factor that distinguishes between the different meanings that gratitude has. One thing we know, it, it seems to be pretty universal as just a way of responding to kindness. I, I, again, that's the thing that's built into us as human beings. When, when people do kindnesses for us or favors, we just, you know, we're just motivated to respond through reciprocity. Why ingratitude is such a vice? Because it just violates every assumption about human nature, right? You, you do something nice for me and I attack you or spread bad, you know, gossip about you or whatever. It's just, you know, it's, it's just uh, so destructive. Um, so we all have that desire. How it's played out and expressed and how it's viewed, that does vary, of course, from region to region, culturally and historically as well. But at a foundational level, I think there's more simil similarities than differences.